قد أنزلته الله إن شاء الله ثم لا أسدد ما تقول هذا الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم قدمنا ما ينفعنا وفعنا بما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم ما شاء الله لا قوة إلا بالله ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا إله إلا الله قبل كل شيء ولا إله إلا الله بعد كل شيء لا إله إلا الله يبقى ربنا ويفر كل شيء لا إله إلا الله ورب العرش العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين We ask for Allah's mercies and blessings upon the noble Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم His household and his companions and all the believers are from this day to the day of judgment I mean I think uh, I thank our Sheikh, yeah. Sheikh uh, Abdul Hakim Balogun, uh, for his most curious God, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and set up some locations from Sheikh Imran Bisiolu, for his most curious God. We ask Allah to accept our supplications, accept our prayers, uh, and grant us our heart desires in this life and grant us his, um, his paradise on the day of judgment. I mean, now, uh, we also pray for all of our teachers. Uh, we pray for our Imam. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with him and we grant him uh, all of his, like his heart desires and grant him goodness in this life and the Amen, ya Allah. So, today, inshallah, we will be having a contemporary discussion. We will be having a discussion about a contemporary topic, a very controversial one, uh, but one which is important nevertheless. Uh, because we're in a society and we're in a world today where uh, it is important for us to have some information about our religion. And our lack of such information can have effects on how, you know, most times we're put on the defensive by people who are not a part of this religion or even some people who are a part of this religion. But we have some nagging questions uh, that we need to ask. And sometimes we don't know how to ask those questions for fear of being you know, being seen uh, in a way, in a paranoid way, or for people to see one as an ignoramus. We avoid asking such questions, but they're important because people use these things against Islam. And in our own bid to defend Islam without knowledge or the, knowing the proper way to answer these questions, we complicate the issues further. Also, uh, in a society where today our children are growing up and they're going to have such questions, they will have people asking them such questions and they might be in a position to uh, want to defend or answer such questions and an inability to answer such questions might make them think maybe Islam is not truly the way, maybe Islam is truly not good, or it's not a good religion. This topic is about child marriage and the Islamic view on it. What is this Islamic view on child marriage, male and female? Uh, we heard people call a noble prophet a pedophile, they would say he married a young girl, uh, uh, he married a girl child, and today because marrying a girl child is not acceptable, uh, they will place it on the prophet to say Islam encourages people to marry a girl, girl child and uh, take away their rights and things like that. But as Muslims, uh, the way to approach this kind of matter, and there are a lot of them, you know, where people pick and choose and then they want to use it as an argument against Islam. So the best way to um, engage in such, such topic is with information. And usually when you have enough information, sometimes you don't engage because there's no need to engage. And sometimes when you engage and you come from that position of authority and knowledge, they will you know, accept that knowledge from you. And so it's important that we ask these questions, amongst, that we discuss this kind of topic amongst ourselves and we get the right information about it. So to begin, I'd like to mention that for the most part, a lot of things, the world was already in existence before Islam came and before rules of Islam came. Islam came and it did three things um, as far as, as regards the things that it met on ground. For some of the practices that Islam met on ground, some of them, Islam did not say anything about it. They are practicing it, it is traditional, it can be regional, it can even be practiced worldwide. Islam came and did not mention anything about it. Those kind of things, people will just continue to do it. 
until and if Allah says something, or the society itself decides on how to rule themselves about such topics. In the second sense, there are some things that Islam makes people doing, practices or traditions or culture of people worldwide, not just Arabic culture, because most of the cultures practiced by the Arabs were also practiced in other parts of the world. Because uh, Saudi Arabia at that time was a place where people made pilgrimage to pre-Islam. People would make pilgrimage to Islam and they bring their culture along too. So some of the things that they practiced in Saudi Arabia at that time was also things that they learned from other people. Um, so when Islam came, there are some cultures and traditions and practices that it forbid. And it would be like, okay, so you have been doing this before. Now, since this time of Islam, we'll call the time before Islam, the Jahiliya time. These are the things that you did before Islam. And now don't do it again. It is now forbidden upon you. Like naming the child in any way that you like. Like burying a girl child. You know, when people are ashamed, if they give birth to a girl, they will bury the girl child alive. We would hope that if they bury it alive, it won't come back again. Because they have to bear male children. That is a show of strength. And it's a show of weakness for one to, 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 uh, to bear a girl child. So such practices, Islam came and frowned upon it and forbade it. Don't bury your children alive for any reason. Maybe you are ashamed of what your peers will say, or even out of poverty. You are, you are afraid of poverty, and because of that, you're killing your children. Don't do that again. Things like that. And also something like uh, drinking of um, alcohol. Islam came and put restriction to that you know, in the beginning. That was something that people were doing and it was normal. Society accepted it. There was no rule against it before that time. Islam came and at the end of the day forbade it for believers. And then in the third sense, in the third sense, uh, there are some practices and traditions and cultures that Islam came, met them doing, did not say stop it, did not keep quiet about it, just had some ideas about it or put some restrictions to it to say, okay, you're doing this thing. What you're doing is fine, but it's excessive. Don't do it this way. Now do it this way. You have a limit of doing it. An example of that is marry more than one wife. That was a practice for Islam. So people say these things today as if Islam came and said people should marry more than one wife. No, marrying more than one wife was cultural. For all around the world, people were marrying 10, 11, 12, they were having concubines and they were doing it excessively. And there was no one making sure that they were being fair amongst all those wives. Islam came, we put a restriction to it that the maximum you can have is four, and you can only have more than one if and only if you can be just amongst them. There was no such restriction before Islam. So Islam came and put a restriction to it to ensure there's justice and there's fairness and everybody is fine. Another thing is that one of the most fundamental underlings of Sharia, that is the Islamic law, is fairness and also making sure that nobody is hurt. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, la nafsan illa wusa'aha. So the Sharia is the rule of Allah and its content is gained from the Quran. So if Allah has said in the Quran that we will not put a burden on anyone that they cannot handle, it means that no burden should come onto anyone from this rule or from the rule of Allah then no burden can come on anyone. So the Sharia will seek to check everywhere that people are not being burdened more, more than what they can handle. And also there's this concept of the Sharia that is fundamental to it, which is la dora wa la jirara. This is an hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that no um, discomfort should come to anyone. From any rulings that you give, you cannot discomfort anyone else. So you can't marry more than one wife and then discomfort them and cause them harm. That being said, one of the other practices again that or traditions that Islam met, that it is not Islam that came and said, marry girl children, it was an existing practice. Islam had a say on it. Islam put a restriction on it to help and make sure that the rights of those girl children are protected. Now, on this matter, there are three opinions. I like us to, um, it's a controversial topic, like I said, and it's going to be a discussion, inshallah. So there are three opinions of scholars on this matter. 
the first set of people said that it is allowed, that Islam allows a girl child or a boy child to be married at a young age. The second view says, Islam only allows the girl child to be married at a young age, not a boy child. The third view says, Islam does not allow children to be married at all. Now, all three of them have their points, and all three of them have their reasons and their proofs. So we're going to present the proofs given by all three of them, and inshallah, we will have a discussion about which is more viable for us. <clears throat> to begin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in um, In Surah Al-Baqarah, <clears throat> when Allah was making a ruling about divorce, when a man would divorce a wife, again, divorce, just to be clear, divorce was also a practice for Islam. It was also a pre-Islamic practice. And the way that if you learn about the way people were getting divorced before Islam, you would appreciate that Islam mentioned divorce because the mention of divorce in the Quran is a way of putting checks and balances in the way that people were divorcing one another. They're protecting the right of both parties in the divorce. Before then, the man can just tell the wife, I've divorced you, and that's all. Can just tell his wife, you know what, the way I'm looking at you now, you don't look like your wife to me anymore. Now, I see you as my, as the backside of my mother. Now, he has divorced her, but she is not free to marry anyone else. So men would use that to punish women. So we'll keep her in the house. If he says those words, just those mere words, saying, you look like the backside of my mother. He has divorced her, but she is not free to marry anyone else. That's a punishment for her. So what did Islam do? Islam came, abolished those kind of practices, and gave rulings on how divorce can be done for both male and female. If you're going to divorce someone, you don't just say, I divorce you. You can, if you say, I divorce you, that's not everything. That's not, uh, that's not the end of it. You have to still, they have to be with you for three months and all that. So the first verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed for this was in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 228, when Allah said, That the one that is being divorced, that is the woman that is being divorced, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 228. That the woman that has been divorced, will stay, will be expectant, will await three cycles. That is, she's going to stay with the man that has divorced her for three cycles, that is, for three months. So she will stay with him and he will continue to be responsible for her. But he won't have any right to go close to her and have intercourse around that time. But what the Quran mentioned here were women, women, actual women, grown up women. When this verse was revealed, the, uh, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they went to the Prophet and they said, Allah has revealed this verse and it has talked about women. What about, what about the young ones? And what about the older women? who are no longer, who don't have cycles anymore? What about the young ones who don't have cycles at all? What about the older ones who don't have cycles anymore? That is, who are menopause? And what about the women who are currently pregnant at the time of divorce? We don't have any ruling for those yet. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, surah to, surah to Nisar, No. Surah to Tolak, verse 5. Surah to Tolak, verse 5. Now, what we're saying now is what the argument of those who say, or the scholars who agree with the child marriage in Islam. This is their argument. And the child can get married boy or girl uh, before they grow, before they are 
of um, mature age. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Qulaq verse 5 said, وَلَّاِي يَئِسْنَ مِنَ الْمَحِيدِ مِنْ نِسَائِ And of your wives, of your women, those who have reached menopause or those who have ceased their cycle in irtabutum, if you are not sure, that is, they're not sure about their cycle, when it's still coming or not coming. So they have reached menopause. That for such people who have reached menopause, after divorce, they will stay for three months in that house, in the orphan's house, in the house of the one that has divorced them. And the one that has not started the blood flow at all, the cycle at all. So the scholars say that if Allah mentioned in a divorce decree, Allah has mentioned someone who, um, who, is, who has reached menopause, and Allah has mentioned someone who has not started the cycle at all. There cannot be a divorce if there wasn't a marriage, right? If there cannot be a divorce if there wasn't a marriage, it means at that time, children, girls, who were not yet of menstrual age or puberty were already getting married. Notice how this verse or the Quran, if I, you won't even have it anywhere, where it encourages intercourse. It doesn't mention intercourse, it mentions marriage and divorce because we seem to mix both of them up. If it says that children can get married, it doesn't say the children should have intercourse. So we're going to clarify that also. So again, this is the argument of scholars that say it is permissible in Islam to marry children or that children should be married off. The Quran mentions children who have not started a menstrual cycle at all. Now, of the scholars who agreed to this argument, there are lots of scholars, but basically all of the four school of thoughts of the Aima that we are uh, that we're used to, they all, all four of them agree to this that it is permissible in Islam that child marriage, male or female, is permissible in Islam. However, they have some points of disagreement in terms of the modalities of it. How do you go about it? There are a lot of things um, that are involved in in a, in a marriage generally, but in a child marriage, there are also other things that are involved, like who is going to give the child out in marriage? Because clearly there's a ruling that says that uh, for the child that is not up to age, that child's permission has to be sought before they can be married off. But for a child, a, a yatima, a yatima, not, not that which is not of age, a yatima who is not of age, the one that has lost her father who's not of age, they have to seek her permission to give her out in marriage. But the one that has a father alive, and this is where the school of thoughts disagree, who is going to give? Okay, so let's say a child can be married. Who has the ability to marry off a girl child? This question will come back to you, inshallah. Now, as part of the proof for those who agree that girl child marriage is permissible in Islam, um, number one of that is that this verse that we just recited, uh, Surah to Surah to Quran, verse 5, where Allah mentioned girls. You know, in a decree for divorce, and I mentioned girls who have not started a cycle. And number two is in Surah to Nur, Surah to Nur, um, where Allah said, uh, and marry those funky old ayam aminkum, funky old ayam aminkum, and marry those who are single amongst you. Marry those who are single amongst you, male and female. Single, have never been married. Um, and the scholars say, Allah says single, it doesn't, it doesn't have any age restrictions to it. It doesn't say they have to be um, of, of certain age and all that. So it covers all men and women, that is boys and girls and everyone, because all of them are covered. They are uh, marriable uh, based on this verse that says, Thank you, Ayama, Min Nezaikum. Thank you, Ayama, Minkum, and marry to those who are single amongst you. Number three uh, of the reasons that they gave is also the ideas of Aisha Anha, where she said,
and it um, it consummated with me when I was nine years old. It consummated with me when I was nine years old. Um, so this was done by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet, as we all know, he wouldn't do it if it wasn't uh, sanctioned by Allah subhanahu wa taala. So this is another proof that this is permissible in Islam. Uh, another proof that they give is that uh, some of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam also practiced this after the demise of the Prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For example, it is reported that Ali radiyallahu anhu married his daughter to his daughter whose name is Um Kulthum. He married her to Umar ibn al Khattab, another of the Prophet's um, companions. This, this is an act between two companions. Ali, a companion of the Prophet, married his young daughter to Umar ibn al Khattab, who is another companion of the Prophet. And at the time that this was done, all the other companions of the Prophet, none of them, no one um, challenged or objected to this, uh, to this practice at that time. If there was anything wrong with it, or if the Prophet um, had said something about it to prohibit it for anyone, then when Ali gave his daughter to uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, some people, at least one person, would have objected, but there's no uh, record of such. Uh, there were also others, uh, other predecessors of the Prophet who um, engaged in this act of giving their child off in marriage while they are still young. Finally, the reason that they gave again to say that this is permissible in Islam is to say that well, this is not a reason, this is like a restriction to it and say, this can be done, this is a practice that, see it as you may, it can portend some benefits for the girl child or the boy child at the time of marriage. Such benefit might not be able to uh, be delayed until they grow up. Such benefit might not be able to be delayed until they grow up. Um, I'm not sure I can think of any immediate kind of such benefit. It could be to avert a war, you know, between two clans. And this is a practice that is not that was not uncommon at that time, right? So it could be to avert the war at that time, to join two families together and avert the war, or to ensure the continuity of uh, the, the wealth of the family or something like that. It could be for such noble reasons that cannot wait until the girl child or the boy child grow up. Uh, so it has to be a pressing need that requires them to do it immediately and at that time without waiting for them to grow up. Uh, these are the reasons uh, or the arguments of those who say that this is permissible. And finally, one major restriction that they give to it, like I said, all the five mazahibs agree on this and they only disagree on who can give the child out. But they also will agree on the fact that the father of the child, the father of the child has the permission, has the ability to give the child out in marriage. The reason for this, and it's very important, the reason that they agree that the father of the child can give the child out in marriage is because it is, it is expected that the father of the child has the best interest of the child at heart. Remember how we have said, it has to be that there's a pressing need that, that requires them to marry up that child at that time. And that that need or that opportunity might be lost if they wait until the child grows up to marry her off or to marry him off to the family they are marrying off. So it is expected that only the father can make such decision in the best interest of that child, male or female. That decision has to be made. It has to be in the best interest of the child. It has to be that that interest or the benefits um, in need for that child would be lost if they don't do it right now, if they have to wait for her or him to grow older before they do it. Again, they agree that the father has the sole responsibility or the sole right uh, to give the child out in marriage uh, to a person. And then you put a condition there for the father that the only person the father can marry his child to has to be a lukafu, someone who is capable, who is seen as capable, who has been adjudged as capable emotionally, physically, financially, and every other, every other way to take care of that person that they are marrying them off to. The father is given the responsibility or the allowance 
to marry off the child, but he also has the responsibility to make sure that the person is marrying off the child to is someone who is extremely capable to handle such girl child and take care of them and protect their interests. Having said that, uh, the second argument says that only the girl child can be married off as a young age. Uh, the boy child cannot be married off at a young age. And even if it is done, that such is annulled, it is void, that it cannot stand. Uh, the scholar that said this one is Ibn al Azam. Um, his own argument is the fact that a boy child, when he grows up, when he's of age, he does not need a wali. A boy child does not need permission to get married when he's old enough. So if you marry him off by force, or if you use the power of the father over him when he's younger and doesn't have a say, when he grows up, he can allow, annul that marriage. So why put him in that kind of precarious situation when he grows up and he has the power to divorce that wife and treat her badly? You can begin using such power. So don't do that to a boy child. Let him grow up and choose for himself. But for a girl child, because even if she is grown, the father still has to give her out. And the father will still give her out at that time with her best interest at heart. So he can also give her out. Now, also most of the scholars will agree that this can be done all stand on the fact that it was done by predecessors. That we are not misinterpreting the Quran, the fact that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, engaged in this practice, and the fact that the Sahaba, uh, after the Prophet engaged in this practice, that this is proof enough that this is acceptable and the Quran is not being misinterpreted. Now, the third argument says that this is not allowed at all, that this practice that Islam does not permit this. They do not accept the explanation of the other scholars, the verse that they presented and the reasons that they present. They make a strong argument. They, broke, they have their own verse, Surah al Nisa, verse six. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the orphan, the orphan girl, the female orphan. And Allah says that, hatta iza balagulika. Surah and Nisa verse 6. Allah is talking about the, the, the orphan child, and the orphan, again, like we said, is one that has lost their father. And the orphan, one who is stamped as an orphan, is one who has lost their parents at an age, at an age before their first wet dream. So we have people, especially in our society, when we hear that. You have to treat orphans right, take care of them, rub their hair, and make sure that you're kind to them. You see old people, grown up people saying, uh, in terms of so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surah to Messiah verse 6 says that test them test the orphans test their intellect test their level of intelligence test their level of maturity until they reach the age of marriage. So the scholars make an argument here that Allah says test their intellect before you give them their properties. Uh, their, um, the will, the properties from the will that is left to them. Before you hand it over to them, test their intellect. Continue to administer that to them to make sure that they are up to age or until they reach the age of marriage. Now, first of all, this verse means that there's an age of marriage. So it can't just be all girls can be married or all boys can be married. There's a certain age of marriage and that age is the age of maturity. That is an age where they are old enough for you to hand over their properties to them. That's an age where you know that they are uh, matured, that you can say they're matured enough to get married also. So they are linking maturity to marriage and saying based on this verse, maturity has to come into play here. If you can say they have to be mature before you hand over their properties to them, then they have to be uh, mature enough before you marry them off. That is the first argument that they have. The second argument for them is the fact that 
So if you say that it is permissible in Islam because the Prophet engaged in it, are you forgetting the fact that there are some things that are exclusive to the Prophet Muhammad An example of that is also the fact where the Prophet has the ability to marry more than four wives, while every other person is restricted to marrying a maximum of four. These are called kususiyah to Nabi. Uh, uh, this, uh, these are special grants given to the Prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only the Prophet that is allowed to do it. And their, their argument is also to say that it is only the Prophet that's allowed, the same way only the Prophet is allowed to marry more than four wives, it's the same way only the Prophet was given permission to marry a young girl child. Because when you say a girl child should only be married to someone who is capable, that there is no man that can be capable of handling a girl child uh, morally, financially, fundamentally, psychologically, and everything besides the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that, that is what it is a valid argument to say that only the Prophet is specifically given that ability to marry a girl child. But on the other hand, the people who say it's allowed also say, what about the Sahabas that did the practice? There's a record example, like we said, like Ali that gave his daughter Um Kuthum to Umar Bun al uh, that that's not the prophet, and he did it, and nobody opposed him uh, in doing so. There are other records of other um, companions of the prophet who did the same thing. Uh, they did not accept this. Now, but for those, again, who make the argument that this is not allowed, the third reason is to say that, okay, let's look at it this way. The essence of marriage, um, the natural, natural essence of marriage is... <laughs> The natural essence of marriage is for two people to come together and fulfill their sexual desires. And the religious um, aspect of marriage is for two people to come together and multiply. That is the religious objective of marriage. Two people come together, multiply, you know, increase your generation so that you can have generations after you that will continue to worship and praise Allah. But the natural tendency, the natural objective of marriage, primary objective of marriage is intercourse, to have intercourse between themselves. And they say that for a girl child or a boy child, they don't even know what intercourse is. So the main objective of marriage is already defeated. If you have a child getting married at a young age before they are matured. So that is their argument in this case. Some of them also make arguments to say that some of these marriages that you are administering before the children are of age can be voided by the student when they grow up. Um, Imam Abu Anifa, for example, um, in, the, in that mazhab of um, um, Anafiya mazhab, their own point of view is to say that a girl child that was given out in marriage, first they agree that a girl child can be given out in marriage by the father or the grandfather, or other men in the family. This, um, this school of thought agrees that the girl child can be married off at a young age by the father or the grandfather or the uncle or other men in the family. But when she grows up in that marriage, when she grows up and attains the age of maturity, she can decide to void that marriage. The other school of thoughts don't agree with this. The Maliki and uh, the, the Maliki school and the Hanbali school say that only the father has the right to marry the girl child off, and when she grows up, she cannot nullify that marriage. Uh, the um, the Shafi'iya school says that the father or the grandfather only can give the girl child out in marriage, and when she grows up, she cannot nullify such marriage. So um, this proponent of saying that this is not acceptable or permissible in Islam, they are going with the school of thought of Abu Anifa to say that if you marry the girl child off at a young age, when she grows up, she's just going to nullify such marriage anyways. Why put her in that situation? Why not just let her grow up before you marry her off in any case? Now, having presented all these three cases, or three arguments, one other thing to note is the fact that Generally, we know that this practice is not something that everybody is doing to now constitute a problem or a nuisance. It is not general. Most parents don't even think about giving their girl child in marriage to begin with. So this is not something that Islam commands people to do. 
So when we hear arguments from people who are not Muslims or even Muslims who don't understand properly, making the argument as if this is a command by Islam and that Islam is such a primitive religion that allows the rights of girl children to be taken away, this is totally wrong. Again, like I said, this was a practice for Islam and Islam has put checks and balances on it. Like saying that if you're marrying your girl child off, it has to be to someone who is capable. If you're marrying your girl child off, there has to be a very pressing need for you to do so. A need that will be lost if you have to wait for her to get uh, to, to grow older before you do it. So it has to be totally necessary for you to engage in this practice. Now, again, saying that we know that people don't practice this generally, but some people still do it. We also know that it is basically not necessary to do this because first of all, unless there's a pressing need to do it, you don't have to do it. In most places, in most countries, there's no pressing need to do this. It might have been the case in the past for people to have reasons to do it. Maybe one kingdom in another kingdom want to come together in marriage to avoid war. Or one rich family and another rich family, one noble family and another noble family want to come together to uh, have continuity in their generation or something like that. Or things that are cogent, that might be cogent reason for them uh, those years or those times or those generations that are no longer cogent reason at this time or in this generation. Okay? Now, having said that, when we also hear arguments about people who say, oh, your prophet is a pedophile, he married a girl he, and, he, and he had, he consummated with her at nine, at nine years old. Those people, when you look at them, you just say to them that they are judging yesterday with today's standards. So it is not until now that it became a thing to talk about the rights of girl children. It is not until now that it became a thing that marrying a girl child became something that you frown upon. This is a rule of society. This is something that society within itself has decided to frown upon at this time. Why? Because there's no more need for it. The society of the time of the Prophet Muhammad totally accepted this. How do we know that? Aisha herself, the subject here, when she narrated this, when she talks, when she, when she narrated the ideas of how she married the Prophet at, at, at a young age of six and how the marriage was consummated at nine, there's no bitterness in such narration. When she narrates the day of the marriage, a state of mind, and the people around her, it shows clearly that she was totally accepting of that situation. The Prophet of, uh, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whom she was being married to, was totally accepting of the situation. They were not being forced upon themselves. Our father, the one giving her out in marriage, was totally accepting of this. He was doing it of his own free will and of his daughter's free will. Also, the society at that time that they were living in was totally accepting of it. No one had any objections to this practice at that time because it was a normal practice. Another thing to note is the fact that when he married her at six, there's no record that says he consummated with her at six. Now, the question that we would ask ourselves is if he was a pedophile or he was doing it and it wasn't a practice at that time and he just did it because he could, why didn't they consummate at six? Why didn't they consummate at seven? Why didn't they consummate at eight? Why nine? Why did he wait for her to be nine? Is that a magic number? Or could it be that she was matured enough at that time, at nine years old, to consummate the marriage? And that's why they waited till that time to consummate that marriage. And that brings us to a very cogent question. Because again, this is a practice on the one hand that can be argued as acceptable in Islam. So when we see people practicing this, because we actually have people who practice this, and when they do practice it, they have their proof that they stand upon. If you find people who say they don't practice it, they have their proof that they stand upon. So both ways, when you see it as a Muslim, we're not the ones that go out to condemn or to forbid what is not forbidden by Islam. You can make an argument for why you will not do it and you will be right to do so. You don't have to condemn those who do it. And personally, I think that the most mistake that we make 
is focusing on that which is not important and talking about that, uh, uh, focusing on that which is not important and missing that which is important. What is not important is trying to argue or defend that this is not accepted in Islam. We even have people, even scholars, who spend their time trying to discredit the ideas of Aisha when she says that she married the prophet at six years old and they consummated at night. You have people trying to find excuses to say, ah, that this is not authentic, when indeed you know that it is authentic. You have people who are trying to say, no, it wasn't at six, it was at seven. You even had, I even had someone, the last time I gave this lecture, I had someone say that they read an hadith where, uh, the, where it was said, historians have said that Aisha did not marry at seven or at six, that she married at 14. And I said to him that, listen, if you're trying to make excuses because you're being challenged by people and you're trying to find a walk around to what is established, you will only be shooting yourself in the foot. Because these people you want to defend your religion to, these people you want to defend your religion to, these are the people who said that everyone has a right of choice. Everyone has a right to choose how they want to live. So much so that they believe that you can be born man and choose to be woman. They defend such people who want to change their gender so fervently. But, they tell you that a woman cannot make a choice to use the hijab. They say you have a choice to do anything you like. You can change your gender, but you don't have a choice in deciding to use your hijab. They will shame you for that. They will take your right away from that. Are these people the ones that you trust? Because these ones want to take your religion. They don't care about what is right or wrong. So when they are attacking, yours is not to find defenses, say it the way it is, it is established, it is an established fact. Don't judge yesterday's standards by today's standards. Yes, you can say it is in the law today that this is not acceptable. And we agree with that and everyone has to follow the law. But don't take that back centuries and then judge the practice of that time which was acceptable and which also protected the right of the girl child. Doesn't also agree that the girl child be molested or anything like that. Now, when I said that we are discussing what is not important and leaving that which is most important for us to discuss, is first accepting that this is a practice that Islam accepts, marrying of young people, a marriage of young people. However, what we should be discussing is, and which will protect the right of both male and female, the one that's been married off and the one they're marrying off, is that the main question is, what is the age of consummation? What the age of marriage is not an argument. Islam permits it. That's fine. Islam permits marrying a child. But what does Islam permit in terms of consummation? At what age can a marriage be consummated between a man and a child or uh, a woman and a child? At what age? That is the main thing. That is where psychology comes in. That is where medicine comes in. That is where knowledge comes in. That is what we should argue. That if you marry a child and you consummate with them and you hurt them and you cause them diseases or things like that, now that is forbidden. Because the basic principle again of Sharia is la dora wa la girara. No inflictions, no discomfort should come to anyone by your actions. Basic principle. So you cannot hurt a girl child, even, if, even someone who is adult. Anyways, what the, what the scholars say about this restriction about when can the marriage be consummated? Um, one school of thought says that the consummation can be an agreement between the father. Again, remember, the responsible father was been given the ability to marry off his child based on a cogent reason that must exist at that time for him to want to do so. So they put it in the hands of the father to say, the father and the husband can come to an agreement as to a time that will be beneficial to the child that would not hurt her to have consummation. So they will both agree that even though you are marrying this child at six years old, you know that you cannot consummate with her yet until she's 12. They can both come to such agreements. In a case where they cannot agree, it is said that when the child, the child asks, they have to leave the child to be nine years old, minimum. And then they involve her in that discussion if she's ready or not. 
a wife in nine years old minimum based on the ideas of Aisha or Yola or Anna. The third school of thought says that consummation should not be based on age. Consummation should be based on physiology and the readiness of the female to accept, to, um, to enjoy such acts. Again, because the basic fundamental objective of consummation or of marriage is uh, for two people to have relations between themselves. So this third opinion is the strongest that says that it, can, it should not be based on age, it should be based on the physiology of the female. That is, you might not be able to cons consummate until she is, you might not be able to consummate until she is 14 or 15 or 18, as far of, until her physiology allows it. If we're saying that today, the rate of growth of our female does not allow consummation until they are 18, that is a valid argument. That is what we should be discussing. That is a discussion we should be having. You know, talking about what is best practices now, uh, what, what age can a girl consummate to avoid all these uh, medical conditions that we hear that females have, which is the major problem. Islam is not the problem. It is the application um, of the rules and the laws that have been laid down that is the problem. And so uh, my own, we have given all of these points of views and stuff. Uh, our own stance is to say that unless this is totally, totally necessary, uh, this practice should, this should not be practiced except for those who find it necessary. Another reason is to say that yesterday's generation needed this and that's why they practiced this. And it wasn't even general. It wasn't done by everyone. It was only practiced in certain situations. Today's generation, we have no need for such. There's no need to practice it. And there's nothing in the Quran that says you have to practice it. There's nothing that says you must practice it. You only do it when it's absolutely necessary. And we don't find such necessity in today's society. However, there are some societies today where it might be necessary. We've had people ask questions about how they do it in the Northern Nigeria, it's tough. But my response to that is to say, the government of today has responsibilities. In situations where you don't have social welfare for people, there's high poverty. You create a necessity for people to want to explore this option. You find parents who are not able to take care of their children, marrying them off to men so that those men can take care of them. So the, the, the society should create a social net that would devoid the situation. Don't give room for the necessity to arise that people can explore, that people can exploit to give us a reason for them to, uh, to engage in this practice. <laughs> Um, I have a question about um, in the Quran, um, this uh, kind of this has to be the Quran is um, oh my man, I can say that it was like that. That phrase to be the Quran is I'm talking about marriage or something like that. So I just want to know, like, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, say that again. Mm -hmm. The phrase oh my man, I can say that it was said in the Quran, it's referring to like marriage and stuff. And I have a question. I don't I check that out in the Quran. Would you bother to check it out? The definition? Yeah. I mean, I I, I checked this, like, sounds like it's like slave, but I want to, like, understand it, like, more better. Part of it.
So do you come? Remember one of the full verse that mentions it. The full verse. It's true. Try, try to remember one um, full verse. Mashallah, <laughs> 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 see this question he asked in this verse that he just quoted. Uh, so when we say malakat aymani, malakat means having power over or having control over. So when we say malakat aymani, what your right hand has control over, this is your slaves, what you own. So women that are owned, and that's again the practice of those times acceptable and stuff until Islam came and reduced the access of people to slavery. And in fact, released people from slavery, made it an act of ibadah to free people from slavery, just to reduce that, that, uh, that practice. So when we say to your answer, uh, to answer your question, say, what do you have control over? What do you have power over? In the female sense, that is female, that you own or you have control over. So that verse that you quoted is talking about um, men and women. And in fact, this is a verse that is quoted when people ask questions about masturbation uh, for, for And Allah talks about this verse, and, and this is a proof that some of the scholars used to say, masturbation is prohibited, it's haram, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, it, it was when it was given the virtues of Muslims or of believers, the saying, well, half is rule of Rujan, those who will protect their private parts, half is rule, protect or watch over Rujan, their private parts, illa ala azwajahim, except over their wives or their husbands. They will use their private parts only with their husbands or wives. Or for those who they have control over, like the slave, male slaves, or female slaves. Well, female slaves. Yeah. For those who have their right hand possesses, yeah. their right hand possesses, right? That their right hand has capability over, that you have control over. But the meaning of those that your right hand possess are your slaves. Well, no, I mean. Very good question. Right along. Questions? Right, he asked, uh, the first question was, when you pray, when you go for sujood, is the nose part of the part of the body that should touch the ground? Uh, there are seven parts of the body that should touch the ground when you go on sujood. The, the forehead, the nose, the palms, the palms should be on the ground spread and facing the Kaaba. Uh, the two knees, put the middle, put the Gemefa, and then the toes. The toes should also be on the ground facing, no? Uh, can you want to say? So, and, and again, the forehead and the nostril, because of the level that you're hoping. 
and also when you gauge them with how your back should be, um, the position that you should be on. Uh, inshallah, I mean, we'll have a session. I think we've had that like twice already. Inshallah, we can have that session again, um, if for nothing else but for the, for the children, inshallah. Uh, and the second question is um, about uh, taking a bath, that right in the bath, can we also take, make wudu after we're done with, with, uh, with the bath? So the, some people will make an argument to even say generally that in the bathroom, you can make wudu there. But then to such people, you say something like, you say things like, uh, no, considering uh, different situations. So when you can look at uh, different kinds of bathrooms, <laughs> yeah, different kinds of bathrooms. Some bathrooms, you know, it's filth everywhere. In such a place, definitely you can make wudu there. When in, the, in bathrooms where it's like a palace already, and, and the filthy part of the bathroom, the toilet is separated from the bath, and the bath is a clean place. Inshallah, after taking your bath, you can make wudu in the same bath, and Allah knows best. In addition to that question, when you see somebody can go to go to the and after that, go to the can actually be select. Wherever they do the ghusl, is definitely. Now, if it's okay to make Janaba use it for Salah. Yeah, that's technical. Yes. Sure. <laughs> um, anyone online, if you have any questions? No. No, we will chat. Oh, any comments on? Okay. Yeah. Okay. If there are no questions, now we shall allow we move on. Hey, yeah, Jenny Billy. Now come to our question. Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay. Um, donation, donation to Um, 